Uh, Mr. Hitchens, uh, you're up first. Thank you for coming. <laughs> nice of you to have me. Um, and nice of you, ladies and gentlemen, to come. And nice for Californians to lay on a day that reminds me of my English boyhood. <laughs> and uh, nice, too, to be in the town, the research institute of which, not long ago, certified Ori Geller as an authorized practitioner of the paranormal for all the reputation of Stanford for scientific scrupulousness. There's always a little uh, black hole through which things can and often I notice do uh, creep. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Ben. Incredibly generous and undeserved, if rather terse and ungenerous introduction. Um, <laughs> I remember thinking, I should say this by way of reply, that when we first met on the set of what was then the primitive version of politically incorrect, imagine what the primitive version looked like, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I remember thinking, he's a nice guy, but he needs to live at least two more lifetimes <laughs> just to live down his work for Richard Nixon. <laughs> and, of course, for all that I wish this for him, I couldn't quite picture two more lifetimes for him, or i better share this with you now, even one more lifetime for anyone else. Now you know roughly where I'm coming from. <laughs> now I've shared that with you. Now, to the purpose, I'm not at all in search of consensus today, in fact very much to the contrary, and I can't imagine how I'm going to be able to use up 14 minutes in demolishing intelligent design as I decline to call it, since it's a propaganda term for creationism. But I'll see if I can waste 14 minutes on it by saying that for consensus terms, we may begin by agreeing that we are in fact here present, that we are present here as actual rational or at any rate partially rational primates, that we are on a real planet and we are on a verifiable solar system. Let's not congratulate ourselves too much on this, but it is an achievement of a kind and it is something we have in common. We can also agree, I think, the chances of this coincidence, or I'd better say really uh, contingency, are fairly remote. Um, they have this, of course, in common with um, other much less rare contingencies. Uh, any of us here today are much luckier in the aggregate than would have been any comparably randomly selected group of people born 500 years ago, whose life expectancy would have been perhaps 30, and whose... Uh, infant mortality rate would have been something ghastly to behold. Or if we were born in today's Congo or Darfur. However, from the observation of exactly precisely the same facts and the same phenomena and the same processes, it's always been possible to draw two kinds of conclusion and it always will be possible to draw two kinds of conclusion. The first is to say that no great decider exists. There isn't a decider who awarded me the right to live while another baby two miles or two thousand miles away barely lived long enough to cry before dying of diarrhea. I don't credit or blame God for these things occurring. Uh, that earthquakes and tycoons occur, excuse me, tycoons probably occur. <laughs> That's what's called by some a Freudian slit. Um, that earthquakes and uh, hurricanes and typhoons and so forth occur uh, not because of the will of divine punishment or divine judgment or divine verdict, but because we live on a climatically volatile planet with a cooling uh, crust which has quite deep faults in some parts of it, including locally. Uh, that would be a better explanation, uh, but it doesn't convince everybody. Um, the laws of nature um, are never suspended. Uh, Albert Einstein said that's the miraculous, the only miraculous thing about them, that they never change, that they're completely regular. Um, and they certainly are not suspended in response to prayer or in response to ritual sacrifices and so forth. Uh, the positions I've just given you are my own positions, my own views. Uh, I didn't think them up all by myself, but I agree with them. Against it, you can always take the view that we are here as the result of a plan. Um, that we are the object of a divine design, that somebody cares about us, and that this plan seems to imply an author or a designer. These same differences in approach have more recently begun to reflect themselves in the fields of biology and physics, but they are the same as they always were. Now, the supporters of creationism, and I recommend the reading of Judge John Jones's uh, verdict, Google Judge John Jones and Dover, Pennsylvania, if you want to understand why I say creationism 
not intelligent design, his ruling in the Pennsylvania court case on this. The supporters of this creationist movement have to be able to do four things to you tonight. Watch and see if they can. They must show first that the cosmos itself can be interpreted in the light of a design, or fine-tuning, as it's sometimes called. They must show, second, that our own planet's hospitality to life is not an accident, not a contingency, and thus might be serving a purpose larger than itself. They, this, these two gigantic attainments, if, if, if available to them, would only get them as far as the implication of an author or a designer. That's what used to be called the deistic position. To get to the position that they really want to occupy, that, they, that is their concealed agenda, if you will, their surreptitious wish, the theistic wish, they'd have to be able to show that this deity was not just a creator or designer, but took an interest in human affairs, wanted to regulate the morality of his creatures, would be responsive to appeals from them, deciding on the matter of rewards and punishments, would care whether you ate pork, would care whether you snipped the end of your dick or your daughter's clitoris, would care what day you took as holy, would care what propitiations you made to him or her. Now that is the end result, and don't lose sight of it. And the stages of initial proof, hard as they are, are the ones you have to watch out for in the meantime. Now our vast new knowledge isn't all that decisive in, in resolving this ancient dispute. But it can be of help. Um, I asked uh, Francis Collins, the, the leading Christian who did the Genome Project, as you probably know, how long he thought humanity had been on the Earth. And I asked Professor Richard Dawkins how long he thought fully evolved humans had been present. Dawkins thinks it could have been as many as 250,000 years. Collins thinks certainly not less than 100,000. 100,000 is all I need. 100,000 years since we definitely separated ourselves from the Cro-Magnons and the um, uh, Neanderthals. I'm exempting from this. Those of you who may have been to the New Creation Science Museum in Ohio where you can see animatronic children playing with animatronic dinosaurs in the same park at the same time. And I'm assuming that I can exempt you from that too, <laughs> sir. Uh, but be aware of what some of the implications of this are. Now, that's to say, if you believe in a divine intervention in our lives, that give it just 100,000 years, for the first 94, 95,000 people are born, they die mainly of their teeth or in childbirth or of microorganisms they don't know exist. Their life expectancy is for the first 50 or 60,000 years, perhaps 25 years, they're killed by animals, they're killed by each other in pointless turf wars, they're killed in typhoons, floods, mudslides and so forth. But gradually, they make slow exponential progress, they get to the point of suffering all the time, and heaven watches it with folded arms, like this. And then four or five thousand years ago, heaven decides we can't let them go on like this. We need an intervention. Probably the best place for it would be in Bronze Age Palestine or Egypt. Probably the best form it could take would be a human sacrifice. That might cheer them up a bit. <laughs> now, if you don't believe this, you do not believe in any of the three monotheistic revelations. That's what you have to believe. That's the minimum you must believe in order to believe in any of those aforesaid. And of course, it's not believable, or shall I put it like this? It only replaces the argument as before. It replaces the argument as it was before we knew about Cro-Magnons, or dinosaurs, or uh, Neanderthals. It argues from design. And if everything was designed, what are we to make of the designer? Who sentenced so many generations to barbarism, misery, ignorance, slavery and early death. In the first place, isn't that rather an incompetent, rather tinkering designer? To say the very least of it. In the second place, isn't it a rather cruel, or at the very best, a highly indifferent one? And we still can't be sure whether this same incompetent and indifferent and cruel person cares whether we go to bed with members of our own gender or not, because there's no way to derive verdicts like this from evidence like that. So the religious still haven't scored the ghost of a point. And that's only to comment on what we know about the last 100,000 or 250,000 years of our own lives. Less than a millisecond of evolutionary or cosmic time. Any study of the process by which it occurred, and we're not, I hope, going to hear that it did not, has to impress us with two further facts that are facts, verifiable, findings, verifiable. The first, 
98% of every species that ever appeared on this earth has by now also disappeared from it, become extinct. The second is how very nearly we as a species joined that list. Look up, if you will, the scientist of the National Geographic who now makes it pop up your own genome, sequence it all the way back to Africa, find out what your ancestry and uh, ethnic parentage is, avoiding the stupid concepts of race uh, that have oppressed us for so long. According to him, by the time we decided to abandon the environment for which our bodies are still adapted, the African savanna, it's very probable due to volcanic eruptions blotting out of the sunshine uh, by particulate matter um, and other terrible occurrences that we were as a tribe down to less than a few thousand individuals before deciding we better get out of this place. We better move on up and out where it's cooler. It's only a, a very, very contingent matter that we made it uh, this far. And we did not make it because we were helped. We did it by our own unaided effort, if I can put it like that. And our organs, as you can see, when you examine the appendix, uh, the jawline, the coat of fur that you grow and shed in the womb when you're three months old, still adapted, annoyingly for us, as, as are your knee joints and many other things, to the African savanna that we had the good sense in time to abandon. Now, uh, that's not the worst of it. You've got to now think what's going to happen to the cosmos and our place in it. I've got two minutes. I'll make the best use of them I can. In the observable universe, the observable universe, there are 400 billion galaxies. Anyone claiming to know enough about this profusion to infer a plan from it had better be very well informed, and I congratulate anyone who tries. When I say observable, I mean something else that's also contingent. Edwin Hubble a few decades ago made the discovery those galaxies are moving away from each other at a very rapid rate that leaves red light behind it. I don't think anyone no long, any longer denies it. Most scientists thought, on operating on usual gravitational principles, that that rate would have to slow down by now. They'd be expanding, yes, but the rate would be slowing. No, it's not. It's expanding. The rate is going up. It's getting faster. It's getting close to doubling. That's only 10 years ago we found that out. That means that galaxies are going to be pulled apart faster than light and going to cause them to drop out of view. That means that the reference points for measuring expansion will go and will dilute everything we found out about the Big Bang to nothingness. In fact, to put it as the great physicist Lawrence Krauss has put it, it will erase all the signs that the Big Bang ever occurred. In other words, those who say to you, how is there something instead of nothing, have got to explain to you how well designed it is, how predetermined it is, that very soon in physical time there will be a great deal of nothingness where once there was something. And that this is part of the plan. That the plan is for nothingness. And in local news, more local news, the Andromeda Galaxy is headed our way directly, collision course, much more local news, just our little suburb of the universe, and it will hit us in five billion years, which is to say, in, in real time, tomorrow. <laughs> in real time, that's very soon. Uh, and that's part of the design. Whose design? What kind of designer? What kind of caprice? What kind of incompetence? What kind of cruelty? What kind of nihilism? What kind of commitment to nothingness? And in the meantime, in the little suburb where we dwell, every other rock in our solar system is inhospitable to life as being too hot or too cold, as is large tract too hot, too cold of our own planet, which is on a climatic and ecological knife edge, as we have good and better and more recent reason to know, and that it is as likely that we'll be able to get out of the way of this and move elsewhere in response to the climate crisis as it is in response to the Andromeda crisis. And that those who try and teach you differently are asking you not to use your intellectual or analytical capacities at all, but to do something very old, very backward, like the Aztecs, like the pre-Galileo, stupefied human beings who didn't know the microorganisms were there, who didn't know about the Big Bang, who didn't know about the red light, and simply to place everything you have on a leap of faith. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, don't do it. You know better. Everybody now knows better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. By your extended clapping, you're eating up into the next speaker's time. Uh, Mr. Richards. Thank you. Uh, 
It's terrific to be here. I, I count it a privilege to be here to be the antagonist today of Mr. Christopher Hitchens. Uh, when I agreed to do this, I called a very prominent Christian philosopher, the closest thing to a sort of professional debater on the existence of God there is, a guy named William Lane Craig, and I said, Bill, I'm going to do a debate at Stanford in January with Christopher Hitchens. He said, you maybe have some words of encouragement for me. And he paused. He said, He's the most rhetorically gifted of all the new atheists. Uh, this is not a word of encouragement. <laughs> You've seen rhetorical giftedness here. But we're here to debate a specific subject. What's the subject? The question is atheism versus theism, right? That's the title of the event. Atheism versus theism and the scientific evidence of intelligent design. Now, neither of us expects either a consensus, of course, on this question, but neither of us expects a knockdown, drag out argument that establishes with mathematical certainty the answer to the question. What I want you to consider here for a few minutes, I've got 12 minutes, I want you to ask the question this way. Let's treat atheism and theism as competing hypotheses, competing attempts to explain the world around us. And consider the things that we know either with absolute certainty or that we know pretty darn certainly. All right? And say which of these things, which of these hypotheses best explains the facts that we take for granted? Atheism or theism? In which place, in which worldview are these things we believe to true most at home? Now, I'm not a literary scholar or a theorist. I'm a lowly analytic philosopher. And so I want, what I want to do is give you essentially a laundry list of facts that I think clearly are better at home in a theistic understanding of the universe than in an atheistic understanding of the universe. Some of these things are evidences for intelligent design. They're drawn from specific evidence and knowledge and discoveries we've made in the natural sciences in the 20th and 21st centuries. Others are things that we know simply from introspection. The first of these, I would call to your attention, is our knowledge and certainty of certain moral truths. Whether you're an atheist or a theist, a Jew, a Christian, or an agnostic, there's just certain things that you know are true about reality. Whatever your sociology professor may have told you, for instance, you know that it's simply wrong to torture little children just for the fun of it. You know that's true. I'm not saying you believe it. I'm not saying you simply believe it as a sort of cultural condition that you're shaped by. I'm saying that you actually know it. You know it with a degree of certainty, at least as certainly as you know that there is an external universe. Mr. Hitchens knows it as well as I do. These are simple moral truths. It doesn't mean there aren't complicated moral truths on which we can ask difficult questions. But there are basic moral truths, odds, that we accept and we recognize. Now the question here is this. It's not whether atheists can adhere to moral truths or they can know them. In fact, the Christian tradition has always been unanimous in saying, as Paul said in the book of Romans, that the Gentiles, although they did not have the law, nevertheless had the law written on their hearts. The question is, of the two competing hypotheses we're considering this evening, atheism and theism, in which one is our knowledge of moral truths most at home? The atheist perspective, atheism is something like the claim that there's no such person as God, that the fundamental reality, the thing from which everything else derives, is something like the material universe. As Carl Sagan put it in his great Cosmos series, the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. That's the fundamental reality. It's an impersonal reality. It doesn't exist for a purpose. It doesn't call us to any particular purpose. The theistic claim is that the fundamental reality is a personal being, a transcendent, eternal, personal being of maximal greatness and maximal goodness, which defines and calls everything else into existence, which has purposes and intentions from eternity. Now, this being is, by definition, goodness and love according to the theistic view. The claim is not that if you're a theist, you recognize moral truths, and if you're an atheist, you don't. The question is, is whether theism or atheism is a better metaphysical home for the knowledge we all have of moral truths. I would argue that it's clearly the theistic and not the atheistic perspective that, uh, uh, that most encompasses and accommodates this claim. Now let's turn to some scientific questions. There's a great essay by physicist Eugene Wigner called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Physical Sciences. What is discernible from the natural world, but I do think there is enough discernible from the public evidence that is available, from the direct introspection to which we all have access, and the best knowledge we have from the natural world, to conclude that there is something like a God. Observing is this strange sort of discovery that we made, especially in the physical sciences, that nature seems to be structured, at least in part of its aspects, according to mathematical formalities. This assumption that there's a rationality, a rational order that can in some sense be reduced to mathematics is not the sort of thing we had any reason to expect. 
Nevertheless, in the West, the founders of modern science who did assume that, people like Kepler and Copernicus and Galileo, they assumed that the natural world was rational, that it made sense, that if they worked hard enough, they could discover an underlying pattern, and that our minds could discern that underlying pattern. Now, why did they discover that? Why did they assume it as a statement of faith? They assumed it because they had a theistic worldview. They assumed the natural world was rational, that it was ordered, and that the human mind was constructed such that it could, if it were, discern that order. Now, we know that the natural world is at least in part this way. The question is whether, if you're an atheist, you have any reason to expect this. Or whether, if you're a theist, that reality makes more sense. We turn then to cosmology, and Mr. Hitchens has actually already summarized the Big Bang cosmology, the basic idea uh, discovered in the 20th century, that the universe had a beginning in the finite past. Uh, ser several lines of evidence point in this direction. The redshift of the galaxies, as he mentioned, the cosmic background radiation discovered in the 60s, even the distribution of the different kinds of elements that we can observe. All of these point to a beginning of the present order in the finite past. Now imagine this. This wasn't a conspiracy concocted by a bunch of creationists in Kentucky. And in fact, when scientists first looked at Hubble's evidence of the redshift of the galaxies, they realized the implication that if the universe had a beginning, then no longer were we relieved of the question, where did it come from? Because in the 19th century, most scientists assumed the universe was eternal. We didn't have any evidence of the contrary. And yet, Edwin Hubble discovered unbeknownst to himself, evidence that the universe had a beginning and which actually confer confirmed a prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now, why does this matter? I think you know intuitively why it matters. Because anything that begins to exist must have a cause for its existence. Now, you could always deny that premise if you didn't know if the universe had a beginning. But now we know the universe did begin to exist. And so it forces upon us the question, what is the cause of its existence? Unless you're willing to countenance that something can simply come from nothing, or that the universe bootstrapped itself into existence, then you're faced directly in the science of cosmology with the question of what caused the universe. And you want an adequate explanation, you're going to want a cause that transcends the physical universe, and that at least has the capacity to bring it into existence. As Mr. Hitchens mentioned, that simply begins the question. But we discover it in the universe that it not only had a beginning in the finite past, but that it conforms to very specific properties or, of which are called the fine-tuning problem. Starting in the 1960s, physicists discovered that when you look at the various laws and constants in physics, things like the electromagnetic force, the gravitational force, and the speed of light, it turns out that all these things rest, as it were, on a razor's edge. That if they were slightly different, if gravity were slightly weaker or slightly stronger than it actually is, the universe, or a universe compatible with complex life, would not be so much as possible. Now, we know that a universe with life is much more intrinsically interesting than a universe without life. And so again, it asks the question, if the universe looks fine-tuned for complex life, was it perhaps fine-tuned? But even in a fine-tuned universe like this, you still have a number of local conditions that have to be met to be able to build a single habitable planet. Now, Mr. Hitchens is right that in a very large universe with something like 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe, it might be that you get just enough chances, maybe you'll get one habitable planet like the Earth just by chance. Maybe we're the lucky recipients of some grand cosmic lottery. But as Guillermo Gonzalez and I argue in The Privileged Planet, there's actually another set of evidence that we think points to conspiracy rather than mere coincidence. What we've discovered when we've uh, looked at the ingredients that you need to build a habitable planet is that those same conditions that make it possible for life to exist on a planet like the Earth, the kind of planet we have, the kind of atmosphere we have, which is transparent to light, our location in the galaxy, the type of sun we have, the weird coincidence that the sun and the moon match in their shapes and sizes in the sky to produce perfect solar eclipses. Those things were all important prerequisites for scientific discovery itself. So that we discovered that those rare places where life are in the universe are also the best places overall for scientific discovery. Now this is just what you would expect if the universe itself were designed for discovery. It is not what you would expect if the universe is a blind concatenation of matter, space, time, and energy that exists for no purpose. Now, these are all evidences for design that exist prior to any debate in biology. Because once you have a habitable planet, of course, it's not as simple as just add water. You have to have the origin of life itself. Water is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for the existence of life. When you're talking about the origin of life, you're talking about the origin of biological information the origin of the nanotechnology that we discover uh, in the nanoscopic scale, the software and the hardware that we discover inside cells, 
that the 19th century scientists like Darwin knew nothing. Darwin assumed that the, the cellular level, uh, it, we had nothing but simple homogeneous globules of protoplasm. And yet we discovered in the mid-20th century exquisite nanotechnology that exceeds any technology that humans have yet devised. That's a question that at least suggests design for an answer. Now, I certainly can't establish it here this afternoon. Then we turn to the history of life. And there we enter the controversial question of Darwinism, which unfortunately in the United States we can barely discuss in university settings without coming to blows. But the truth of the matter, and the question of the matter, is this. It's not whether Darwin's theory of evolution explains some things. In fact, the staunchest young earth creationist uh, openly admits and accepts that natural selection explains many things in the natural and the biological world. Natural selection clearly explains the survival of the fittest. It explains things like the variation in the thickness of beaks in the Galapagos Islands, for instance. The question is whether there are things in biology that are inaccessible to the Darwinian mechanism. Are there things that have to be constructed with all the parts in one time and place in order for their function to exist? Are there things, that is, that natural selection can't reach because there aren't any functional intermediates? That's an empirical question, uh, and it's a question that uh, bi biochemist Michael Behe opened in his book, Darwin's Black Box. The debate goes on, but Behe argues that there are many structures at the microscopic scale, especially in biochemistry, that are what he called irreducibly complex, and that doesn't mean really, really complicated. What it means is that there are certain structures in biology that have to have all their parts working and in place, the same time and place, in order for them to perform a function. That is, in order for them to provide an organism with a survival advantage. Natural selection doesn't have foresight. It selects for current survival advantage. It can't say, well, if I hold these five protein parts and eventually get 35 more, I'll eventually have a bacterial flagellum, or I'll eventually have uh, a blood clotting cascade. Foresight is the exclusive jurisdiction of intelligent agency. And so when we discover structures in biology that suggest foresight and suggest that they are inaccessible to the Darwinian mechanism, we rightly raise the question of design. That's in biology. Now let's again return to introspection, because there are two things that each of us experiences directly, neither of which seems to be at home in an atheistic picture of the world. The first is consciousness. We all experience directly the fact that we are conscious subjective agents. We experience first-person reality. And yet, if you look at many consistent materialist and atheistic philosophers like Daniel Dennett, they admit that the existence of consciousness in a purely material universe is an incomprehensible mystery. So that Dennett and many other atheistic philosophers finally have concluded that consciousness is an illusion. Now, any worldview that implies or concludes that you don't exist is perhaps a worldview you have a reason to doubt. And then finally, our own direct experience of freedom. We all take freedom for granted. We know what it feels like to act freely, to choose one thing rather than the other. We recognize when we're being coerced. We know when we're uh, uh, committed to an ideal and are able to pursue it against adversity. We experience freedom directly. And yet that freedom, which we know directly, makes very little sense in a materialistic and an atheistic universe. But if we are creatures, agents created ultimately by a supreme agent, then at least we have a metaphysical home for the direct experience of freedom that we have. So I conclude with that by saying, quite to the contrary in Mr. Hitchens' argument, there has never been a time in the history of the human race in which it's better to be a theist. Thank you. Mr. Hitchens and Mr. Richards now have four minutes each to respond. Four. four. Okay. Um, I'll do it in reverse order, if I may. First, um, if we have free will, by definition, we cannot be granted it. We can't be given it. My uh, <clears throat> Hitchens' paradox states, um, of course we have free will. We have no choice. <laughs> uh, to say that it's a gift is to negate the whole concept of free will on its face. So... If that isn't self-evident, I can't think of anything that would meet the definition of being self-evident. Now, because I'm not a scientist, I thought I would front-load my uh, first lot of remarks by some discussion of the scientific. Um, uh, most of my atheist friends are scientists, just as um, very few of my scientist friends are believers, so we're, each of us are members of a different minority. But um, I'm glad you started on the question of innate morality. 
and that you centred it, as people tend to do when they're looking for an example, on the question of children. Yes, it's true, first, that children have an innate understanding of what is right and what's wrong and don't need it inculcated, which means they don't need the Ten Commandments to come from Sinai, a place that's never been established to exist, uh, or from any deity, uh, no other deity having ever been shown to have had even approximate chance of existing either. It means it is innate. It's, we wouldn't have survived this long as primates if we didn't have a sense of solidarity and obligation to one another. Why make uh, so complex something that Occam's razor can clarify you for you? Well, the answer to that is, in the religious uh, mind, well, how would you know without divine permission? Um, if there was no God, wouldn't it be true, as Dostoevsky's Smerdyakov says, that anything was permitted. That's the way the argument goes, is it not? Without this divine supervision, this celestial dictatorship, we might conclude that we'd do anything we liked. Well, if that's true, and I don't believe it is, because many people are perfectly capable of good behavior when no one's looking, and you can't prove to me that that's any less or more likely for an unbeliever than a believer, but uh, put it the other way around. Um, how likely is it that someone would do something really wicked because they did believe in God? Now, everyone here has instantly thought of an example, haven't they? Of something absolutely foul that they wouldn't do, that they've recently heard of being done by someone who's a person of faith. As, for example, sending a child with Down syndrome in Iraq, carrying a parcel into a polling station on the first day of the Iraqi elections, not knowing that it was a bomb. I wouldn't do that. And I don't believe in hell. They would do it because the kid is going to go to heaven. If it does this, it may not know it does. It's going, it's going to dance in there. The, the genital mutilation community is entirely religious. The suicide bombing community is not exclusively but almost uh, wholly religious. Um, I'm sorry to say that the child molestation community, those whose slogan is no child's behind left, are pretty <laughs> determinedly theistic. Don't come to me with morality, please. It's an insult to me, and it's, a great, I think, a great offense, not just to this audience, but to the many, many victims of people who have suffered from this, uh, this false antithesis. Um, how can it be argued? I've got a minute, I think, now. How can it be argued that something that's on a knife edge for life, a knife edge for life, could go either way, that keeping us on the knife edge proves there must be a designer at work. Why would a designer keep us on a knife edge where at any moment our planet might tip to be where the other planets he made were? Dead. Lifeless. Where nothing happens. The knife edge proves a designer? It proves nothing of the kind. And if it wasn't life, it would be death that they'd use for their argument from design. Professor Francis Collins, the man who helped us sequence the Human Genome Project, says that he went for a hike one day in the wilderness. We've all been impressed by nature in our day, as we have by music and by sex and by love and by many other things, to feel that there's a transcendent. But Professor Collins goes and he sees a frozen glacier with the three streams of river frozen in a trinity. Nothing can live up there. It's a lifeless thing. It happens to be a metaphor for Christianity. He falls to his knees and accepts Jesus as he sees this, and he expects us to think that that's an argument and that that's evidence. Well, as I say, scientists or people who claim to be interested in science can believe weird and foolish things. Just be aware that that's the deal you're being offered today. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> Jay Richards. So a couple of things, and I should probably restate uh, my position since Mr. Hitchens seems to have responded to an argument I did not make, but which he apparently expected. I did not argue that atheists will do bad things and theists will be good, do good things. Did. What did I argue, though? This was the argument. In which perspective on the world do the moral truths that we all know most fit? That is a separate question. It's a separate question. What are moral facts, after all, on the atheistic view? The atheistic view metaphysically must finally reduce to something like reality is matter in motion, purposeless matter in motion. It has no purpose or intentions. Our own intentions ultimately reduce to purposeless processes. The theistic view, on the other hand, is that a personal being has existed from eternity with intentions with purposes. 
and in the Judeo-Christian form, a being who is pure goodness and love. It's a separate question whether people who believe in God or some version of God or some perspective of God have acted in accordance with the moral laws, the fundamental truths we all know to be true. That's a different question. We're asking for where the evidence points in terms of two competing hypotheses, atheism versus theism. I am pointing out that all of us, those on the stage, and each of you, if you're properly functioning, know moral truths. And I'm asking, is it the theistic view of the world or the atheistic view of the world that makes the most sense of those truths and that accommodates them the best? That's a separate question. And I think there's also a basic confusion when we're talking about design. When we're arguing for design, there's basically two claims. One is simply that intelligent agents from time to time leave markers behind of their activities. Now we all know this, Mount Rushmore is an empirical marker, that is, it's a marker that we can observe and tell an intelligent agent left that. We recognize that Mount Rushmore is different from the various other rocks and hills in the Black Hills of North Dakota. So we know intelligent activity is detectable. But intelligent design makes a second claim, that those detectable marks of intelligent activity are present in the natural world as well, in the part of the world that we study in cosmology, in astronomy, in biology. It's hard work, but it's an empirical question. And a sneer is not an argument. And guilt by association is not evidence. The question is whether those empirical marks that we recognize every day in our everyday activity as human beings, if those markers of intelligence are available and apparent in nature are or not. And it's a second question whether that design is good or evil. And I would be happy to address that question at a later time. But whether the design is apparent is a separate question apart from it. Thank you. Now, I, I understand we have some questions no, on... No, we're going to take from these, these questions. I, I, we, have, we have a list of questions, and I also have questions that have been suggested to us by your comments and very, very brilliant points you've both made. I'd like to start with you, Chris, which is um, a question which is... You, you pointed out that uh, Einstein said that there are certain laws, physical laws, that never change. That's the glory of them, is that they never change. Who, who created those laws, or where did those laws come from? Why, why do those laws exist? How, how did that? How did the laws of <clears throat> thermodynamics and gravity and motion and so forth come about? Well, the answer to that is you know as well as I do is that nobody knows. But suppose that we were to ask the question, which we're bound to, because we are mammals with a pattern-seeking imperative uh, that, that impels us to ask this. Suppose we were to say, well, someone must have, then. The next question would be, well, where does that someone come from? So all you get from this is an infinite regression, which is highly and deeply unsatisfactory. The reason why Einstein's observation that the laws of nature remain so tense, so taut, so perfect, so symmetrical, so in place, so uninterrupted, that, that it is this undergirding matter that is uh, so miraculous, is that it completely uh, negates the theistic, not the deistic, but the theistic position. In that case, those laws are not suspended because Mother Teresa has interceded for some Bengali peasant. Well, what, what or because um, someone's prayed to a virgin or because Muhammad wants it said that he's flown on a horse uh, on a night journey to Jerusalem. These things do not, cannot occur and those who think that they do are fooling themselves and attempting to fool others. So it's a question of how, whether you think it applies to the deistic or the theistic interpretation. What, what you I'm sorry. Yeah, I'd love here. to address that question. It's a good one. First, um, Mr. Hitchens made two points, actually. First, to the question, where did the, the, what we call the fine-tuning of both the initial conditions and the forces and constants of nature come from? I described this. You can think of the forces you're familiar with, like uh, electromagnetism uh, and gravity. There's other forces, like uh, the strong and uh, weak nuclear force. We call those the nucle nuclear force in Texas, but I'm bilingual now. Um, <laughs> The, 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 this is a discovery, again, of, of the physics community. This was not a cabal of creationists in Kentucky that came up with this question. It's called the fine-tuning problem. And I think it's a legitimate question precisely because we know the universe had a beginning. Now, it's simply nonsense to say that saying that it's the result of design is an infinite regress. Because the point is this. We have competing hypotheses. Is the material universe the fundamental reality, or is there a personal cause to the material universe? 
The claim is not that everything has a beginning in its existence. Every worldview has a fundamental resting point in explanation. Every worldview needs and wants some necessarily or eternally existing reality. Now, the materialist of the 19th century could simply say it was the material universe. That's now off the table. The material universe is a crummy candidate for ultimate explanation precisely because it has a beginning. God, or a designer, is not, in the same way, a crummy explanation because we would posit that God is the necessarily existing thing, whereas we know empirically that the natural world is not. So the infinite regression argument fails. Now, the, to the notion that uh, there's some problem with the suspension of natural laws, I'd point out that there's probably not a serious theistic or Christian theologian which would define miracles as the suspension or violation of physical laws. Whatever Einstein may have said, the laws that we observe in nature are sort of like the grammar uh, the regular activities of the material objects that we see. They're formal descriptions, but they're not overarching laws that control in some way. And you have to finally get back to the metaphysical question of what the fundamental reality is. If theism is the answer to fundamental reality, if God is the ultimate reality, then the laws are simply a reflection of what the natural wor world does regularly. But just because, for instance, I drop a pen or throw a pen in the air and then catch it, right? Have I violated the law of gravity because I stopped it from dropping to the ground? Oh, come on. No, of course not. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not? It's a serious question. Why? Because the laws of physics that we talk about are generalizations. They're sort of uh, you know, if everything stays the same. They don't violate agent causation in the human case, and they certainly would not violate the freedom of the God who called the universe into existence to act freely in his universe. The image of God is a blind watchmaker that set things up and should most appropriately have left it to wind down on its own, is a deistic metaphor. The theistic metaphor would see God in the material universe as like a gardener, a garden, gardener who creates his garden and then chooses to tend it. Now, it's of course a separate question of whether we can detect this or whether God normally acts in the material world in some way that it's undetectable, but there's nothing incoherent or contradictory or unscientific about the basic theistic view, once you understand what it means to speak of a physical I law. Since the Christopher has a response. I think well, if I, if I may, it would take the form of a question, because, and I'll tell you why, because I know it's, it's been in Michael's province to ask questions, and you can say that it's not mine if you wish, but you can, um, I, um, you can have I think everybody here knows, now must have guessed roughly what I think about religion, <laughs> um, but I don't know what you think about it. Okay, For go example, ahead. I don't, and this happens to me all the time. Uh, I sometimes say to Christians, so you say you're a Baptist, yes. So you believe in Calvin and predestination. I didn't say that. I thought you said you were a Baptist. No, not exactly. No. I want to know from you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin? Yes. Do you believe he was resurrected from the dead? Yes. Do you believe that the Prophet Muhammad took a night journey to Jerusalem on a horse? I don't know. You don't know? Right. You're open-minded on that? I just don't know. Do you think that, uh, that a God made a uh, covenant with just one people, the Jews, at Mount Sinai? I think he made a covenant with the Jews specifically, as it says in the text, to bless all the peoples of the earth. I, yes. re I rest my case. I rest my case. Right. I am uh, an admitted Christian. I rest my case. <laughs> At least, ladies and gentlemen, this is much more honest than I generally get. Most people say, you ask a Catholic, do they believe in the virgin birth? They say, they, first they show they don't know the difference between the virgin birth and the Immaculate Conception. Second, they say you don't really have to. And so he's, this is an honest guy who's just made it very plain, plain to you. Science has nothing to do with his beliefs. Okay, can I? <laughs> nothing, nothing at all. That's to his credit. He hasn't done that at all, but to be honest, that's okay. Chris, why are some... In, 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 I promised my mother. Christopher, in, okay. <laughs> so it's my name. In the, in the, uh, in the, uh, if it's so incredibly clear to you that the religion is a hoax and a fraud, why are so many people in America deeply religious? Are they just stupider than you? <laughs> um, well... Again, I'll take your question in reverse order, if I may. Yes, I think I am smarter than most people in the United States. <laughs> and the polls find that most people agree uh, with that proposition. And only stupid people answer opinion poll questions. Um, second, I actually have not said that religion is a, is a hoax or a fraud. Uh, there, are, there are fraudulent elements to it, 
as there always has always been, the sale of indulgences, um, the, the promise of the miracle cures, and uh, so forth, uh, the offer of false consolation. But I describe it in my book, God is Not Great, available at fine bookstores everywhere. <laughs> and I bring the work of great... <laughs> I bring the I bring the work of uh, great philosophers and scientists in my uh, more recent anthology, the the Portable Atheist, an anthology of um, writings of unbelief, uh, to bear to say that no, it, it is the oldest argument uh, that our species takes part in, um, and it's the reason why I'm fascinated by it, interested in it, uh, willing to conduct it, never refuse a challenge to do so. Um, religion was our first try at, at cognition. Uh, it was our first try at epistemology. It was our first try at philosophy. It was in some ways our first try at mathematics. It's what we came up with because we are pattern-seeking and ambitious and freedom-seeking mammals when we didn't know we lived on a round or spherical planet. We didn't know that we were in circulation around other heavenly bodies. We didn't know about gravity. We didn't know there were microorganisms stronger than ourselves that explained a lot. Um, we didn't know why the heavens darkened and rained or hailed. We didn't know why there were earthquakes or floods. It was the first tremulous attempt to make sense. And, it's when, and in the work of Aquinas and um, Augustine and elsewhere, we see the first glimmerings of our attempts at philosophy. And in the Cranmer prayer book um, and the King James version of the Bible, that happened to be my favorites, um, and the English hymnal, uh, we also have the beginnings of a literature. Uh, the first time everyone who could read had all read one book and had a common discourse. So it's, an, for me, a very, very important and honorable and at its best even a, a noble subject. But of course it is man-made and a delusion. And it is used by wicked people to exploit the credulousness of innocent people to create uh, not an eternal life or a life of freedom in, in, a, in another world, but a real, actual, material, secular dictatorship now claimed by people who, uh, who uh, have the arrogance to say that they themselves are acting in the name of God. And that's why it has to be opposed. Okay. So, Richard, so Richard, uh, I'll let you respond to that, and then I have a question for you. Okay, my, my response, I, I want to make clear that the, the actual subject of the debate is the question of atheism versus theism and not the question of any specific religion. Uh, obviously, theism manifests itself in some particular form, in Islam or Christianity or Judaism, but that is, in fact, a separate subject, and so I, I, I prefer to uh, restrict my comments to the subject of the debate sorry, itself. Is that the wrong way around? I'm sorry, because that's why I mentioned all religions, too, instead of just one. Right, and I, don't, I, I do not think, and I think we probably agree on this point, uh, that the simple prevalence of a particular religion in a society is any particular mark uh, for its truth or falsehood. There are perhaps, you know, a billion Buddhists in Asia, uh, over perhaps a billion Muslims around the world, and over a billion Christians. So I don't think simply the numbers answer finally the question of the truth of one or the other. Uh, and I think that the, the reasons and the basis on which we decide a more philosophical question, such as atheism or theism, are separate. This has always been the case in the Christian tradition, that the natural world, as Paul says in the book of Romans, he says, from the foundation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen from the things that have been made. That is, that the existence of a creator God is the sort of thing that you can discern if you look at the natural world around you. That doesn't mean that every question we ask as human beings or everything, for instance, that a Christian would believe about God is discernible from the natural world. But I do think there is enough discernible from the public evidence that is available, from the direct introspection to which we all have access, and the best knowledge we have from the natural world, to conclude that there is something like a god religion. I do not think that's the basis on which we establish the more specific claims of the religions. This must be the same St. Paul who rests everything on what he calls the evidence of things not seen. Must it not? You see, this happens all the time when you, when you talk with the, the religious or those who believe these books are more than, they, more than man-made texts. Uh, St. Paul says, the evidence of things not seen. It's, it may be the most uh, beautiful of his letters that insists on that. Uh, Jesus says, I come not to bring peace but a sword. Half the people you meet say they love Jesus because he preaches non-violence. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's no mention of hell. There's no punishment of the dead. You may die a horrible death of ethnic cleansing ordered by God and massacre even of your children and confiscation of all your possessions mandated by God but he's done with you when the grave closes over you there's no punishment of the dead gentle Jesus meek and mild proposed by the New Testament types as a 
less forbidding figure than the Old Testament God says, depart from me if you don't agree, into everlasting fire. So the filthy concept of hell that's been used to terrorize children and lie to people by cynical priests and rabbis and imams for years, less so the rabbis, uh, is, is, comes from gentle Jesus meek and mild. Which book are these people quoting from? Which bit of it? Why do they think it isn't man-made when it so self-evidently is? We don't have any supernatural authority, ladies and gentlemen, in literary criticism. We're left alone with our day, and the time is short, and history to the defeated may say alas, but cannot help or pardon, and the reference upward to the supernatural authority is an abdication of our most precious faculty, our own responsibility. And we can't, we cannot, we cannot abdicate that. And religion asks us to do so. Yes, I, with all due... <laughs> Christopher, with, with the greatest possible respect, Christopher, the, uh, chap. the, uh, the, the uh, Jewish prayer books do, and, and the Old Testament do, Jewish prayer books do repeatedly refer to being inscribed in the book of life and not in the book of death. So I think there must be some belief in life after death, but maybe I'm mistaken. Well, Judaism makes less of the afterlife than Christianity or Islam does, considerably less. And it also, of course, doesn't proselytize as much, or really at all, except among Jews. Um, and it doesn't make the stupid mistake of saying that the Messiah has already arrived, which um, Christianity does make, and uh, Islam sort of suggests at least that the, the final revelation has already occurred. At least, at least Maimonides has the grace to say the Messiah will come, yes, but he may tarry. Do you, do you uh, that, I would say that Judaism is superior because it makes the, a, a racist sectarian claim that God has revealed himself only to one Bronze Age greedy, ambitious, military tribe. But it is, it is at least a little superior to the stupid Christian and Islamic plagiarisms that have been stolen from, from uh, Jewish uh, books. I think you're from that tribe too, Chris. So there, there's a... Uh, so yes, there's, I speak with feeling. So, but there's a... Uh, but there, uh, do, do, do you not think... regard myself as particularly redeemed or marked in my foreskin uh, for a special... Uh, that's not a revelation or, or <laughs> salvation, and I despise anyone who thinks like that. I don't think people should think with their dicks, or their epidermis, uh, or their pudenda. Okay? You, Call me old-fashioned if you like. Christopher, do you, okay. Christopher do, you, do you think that there are tens of thousands, if not, I don't know the exact number, but hundreds of thousands of men and women who work in, the, in faith in this country, do you think they're all charlatans and frauds? No, I don't. I mean, I've met, people, I've met many people who are more, um, I would consider morally superior to myself, not just in this country, but in other countries too, who it's quite clear to me are doing what they do for their faith, which often is, for example, Mormonism, which I consider to be a racket, or Pentecostalism, which I consider to be a delusion, but they're doing it for that reason. However, all over the world and in the United States, I've met people who try and help others for its own sake, not to proselytize for their church, not to proselytize for their faith, not to argue that there are in, invisible means of support or later means of redemption, but because they are humanists and humanitarians. And I think it's to them that the credit should go. I have to say I suspect those who go as Mormons to work in Bolivia to try and convince ignorant, innocent, needy, desperate people by handouts that Joseph Smith dug up gold plates written by God in upstate New York. I, I think that's a terrible way to be living your life. Mormonism is not our topic tonight. But <laughs> We've just got several subjects that are not faith, our topic. Faith here. is, though, and if, no, if, 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 that, if, faith could, if, faith, if faith is good, that's as good as anyone else's. Well, let me just and say as this. a motive for charitable work, which was the question Comrade sure. Stein asked me, as a motive for charitable missionary work, it's a, a notoriously very strong one, is it not? Mormons have to spend a lot of time as missionaries working for others to convince them that an absolute crackpot fantasy is me, a gift from God. Let me bring it back to religion and science if I could for a moment. Uh, uh, this question for both of you, and I'll begin with uh, Jay Richards. So the late crackpot Steve... racist fantasy, by the way, since until 1979, no, no You're black... You're filibustering here. No, no black... No. <laughs> since I was asked. Chris, I know I did... racist fantasy since... Until 1979, no black person was admitted by the Mormon church to have a soul. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you back so the next time for, for our discussion about Mormonism mm -hmm. in its history. <laughs> 
But right now, what I'd Dave. like to do is bring it back to religion and science, and I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Richards, uh, and I'd like for Christopher to comment, the late Stephen Jay Gould, uh, a man that Christopher greatly admires, and many of us do, noted that, that surveys show that almost half of all scientists are religious. So he commented, either half of all my com uh, colleagues are enormously stupid, or else the science of Darwinism is fully compatible with conventional religious beliefs and equally compatible with atheism. What is your reaction to that, Mr. Richards, to Gould's observation about science? Well, Scientists I think it's true, and it has been for about 80 years, that if you, if you poll general natural scientists, it's between 40 and 50 percent. Strangely, the, the physical sciences and mathematics seem to be a little over 50 percent. Uh, sociology is down in about 20 percent. I don't know the significance of that. Uh, but that's sort of the spread, and it's been about 50-50 for about 80 years. Uh, so I think it's a contradiction at least of the, uh, the certainty of the secularization thesis, which is that the more intelligent people get, the more secular and less religious they get. Um, I do, however, disagree with Gould about Darwinism. I don't think that Darwin's theory of evolution is logically incompatible with theism. It's possible that God created a world in which he set things up in such a way that or, uh, organisms have a certain type of adaptability that's sort of open source so that they, they derive most of their adaptive complexity through a process from the environment. That's sort of the, the picture that Darwin, Darwinism would paint. So I don't think Darwinism per se, because it really is simply a description of the complexification of life after you get the origin of life is fundamentally or sort of logically incompatible with theism. So I think it's really an empirical question of whether organisms are actually built that way, what the explanatory power of Darwinism is, and so forth. Nevertheless, I tend to agree more with Richard Dawkins, who said that Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. He didn't say it proved that God didn't exist or something that strongly. His point was that there are many things in biology that look very strongly to most people, at least intuitively, like they're designed. And, and Dawkins and many people took the Darwinian revolution to sort of finally establish and vanquish this last area of the natural world from this design intuition. The reality is, though, is that the evidence waxes and wanes. I think there was a time in the 19th century when the case against design was stronger than it was now. Uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, when we know the universe had a beginning, and I think we know much more about the limits to the Darwinian mechanism and much more uh, rigorously understand the nature and the aspects of designing, I think we're in a different perspective, both intellectually and philosophically, but also with respect to the evidence. So I, I wouldn't fully disagree with Gould, but I do say that Darwinism, uh, if it's totalizing ex explanation, sort of encourages atheism, and that if there's strong evidence for design in biology, that sort of encourages theism. That's how I'd put it. For your response to Gould's comment. I, I should be quick because I've been, I've been because of hogging time for now. But um, Sir, Sir Isaac Newton, the founder of modern science, um, believed in alchemy and spent a lot of his time practicing it. The traces in his hair of lead and mercury from alchemical crazy experiments are very heavy, the hair that his uh, descendants kept. Uh, he wouldn't take his oath. He was supposed to Cambridge to take an oath to the established church. He wouldn't take it because it meant taking an oath to the Trinity, which he regarded as a vile heresy from the whore of Babylon, the Church of Rome. Uh, he wanted to keep all Catholics out of the university. Uh, he was an, a madman when it came to religion. He thought everything in the universe could be inferred from the design of the Temple of Solomon, which he thought he could work out from first principles, that he was the greatest scientist of his day. Alfred Russell Wallace, Darwin's great collaborator and perhaps um, forerunner, uh, was never happier than at spiritualist seances with ectoplasm. Uh, Joseph Priestley, who we think effectively discovered oxygen, believed in the phlogiston theory. Francis Crick, who discovered with James Watson the double helix, thought, as Newton did, that um, human life probably came to Earth as the sort of semen on the end of the comet's tail, or the meteor's tail. We were seeded from the... Uh, 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 his colleague James Watson has recently proved himself to be a pseudoscientific racist. Um, pretty shabby record. Uh, there is absolutely nothing in science that prevents you from being uh, a crackpot, a racist, a nutbag, um, an eccentric, uh, a pseudoscientist as well. Uh, that's the way we're made. Um, not until Albert Einstein does one get pure mind, more or less pure mind, and more or less pure humanism. And even he was very soft on Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union. Christopher, okay, we're getting a lot of good questions we're around the country, and so we're going to go to those questions, and also from the audience. And I think, Ben, you have those questions. I have quite a few questions here. I'll ask you this first, uh, Jay. Uh, may I call you Jay? Yes, please. <laughs> what, is the, what is the purpose of life, and what are we living for? Uh, 
you have one, you have that one again minute. is not the subject of the debate. I don't. I don't believe uh, as as has been exposed. We'll I'm just a Christian. Play with it for I'm a essentially a, an evangelical Christian. I I happen to like the Westminster Shorter Catechism's answer that the chief end of man of human beings is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I like that. I don't think you're going to discern that from cosmology or from astronomy or from any of this publicly available evidence. I think it's separate. Uh, to refer to the previous question, it's a separate question what scientists believe, the scientists, and what the best scientific evidence we have is. That's why I insisted on trying that I made previously on the best evidence we have, the things we have very good reason to believe are true. It's quite the case that scientists and literary theorists and philosophers believe all sorts of things. And so we want to ground our arguments in the best evidence that we have. But I don't think all of the religious questions that every human being could ask is going to be discerned or answered from these publicly available evidences. The truth of the matter is, Thomas Aquinas pointed out, as important as the arguments for God are, if everyone had to know those arguments, very few people would believe in God. It's sort of the grandma problem. You know, my grandma doesn't know the theistic proofs. And even though I've studied them, I actually forget the arguments myself and have to bone up on them again before discussions such as this. And so we can have direct experience of God, an intuitive experience of God, but that can't be the basis for our arguments for others, like a private revelation. You might have a private revelation that justifies your belief in God, but it's not a public argument. So that's why I hope we will decide these questions insofar as we can, on the publicly available evidence, and rest content that questions such as the purpose of your life or my life are more fine-tuned or precise questions than we're going to get answered from the evidence we're considering. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, Tertullian, one of the church fathers, said that one of the great things about being in heaven was you'd be able to watch the, the writhings and the tortures of those who'd been sent to hell. And I think what I mainly live for is uh, contemplating the misfortunes of other people. Um, well, that leads me to a very... That, and, uh, that and vindication, being proved repeatedly and over and over again right when other people were wrong, that does a lot for me. Um, but raising the sights a little, just a fraction, um, I'd say that, that to me that what matters most is the pursuit of happiness, in the words of our greatest founding father, uh, and the pursuit of liberty, freedom, and that these things are incompatible completely incompatible with the worship of an unalterable celestial dictator. Someone who can watch you while you sleep and convict you of thought crime, and whose rule cannot be challenged, and who's the big brother whose, whose eternal reign uh, may not be disputed. That makes the concept of the pursuit of freedom and happiness completely negative, it negates it. Uh, so I, I, one of the things I live for is to return a stout and joyful non serviam to this dictator who I'm pleased to find doesn't really exist but is instead a creation of those who want to install a theocracy in the real life where I can participate and I'm not going to give them an inch. The second uh, thing I live for is um, if not exactly passing on my genes taking part in activities that might allow those genes to be passed on. <laughs> and not <clears throat> and uh, not scorning the, the three delightful children who result, who are everything to me and who are my only chance of a, even a glimpse of a, a second life, let alone an immortal one. And I'll tell you something, if I was told to sacrifice them to prove my devotion to God, if I was told to do what all monotheists are told to do and admire the man who said, yes, I'll gut my kid to show my love of God, I'd say, no, fuck you. Thank and you, so should you, and the religions that say you should admire infanticide as but proof of the love of God have no claim, no claim at all to be preaching ethics, let alone morality. So then are you opposed well, to uh, abortion? Hmm? Uh, Christopher, Christopher, oh, please. Christopher, so does, does that mean that you are, are you involved in the pro-life movement in that case? Um, I believe that the concept unborn child is a real concept, yes. Um, and I've had a lot of quarrels with uh, some of my fellow materialists and secularists on this point. I think that if the concept child means anything, the concept unborn child can be said to mean something. And actually, all the discoveries of um, embryology, uh, which have been very considerable in the last generation or so, and of viability, appear to confirm 
uh, that opinion, which is, I think it, it should be innate in everybody, is innate in the Hippocratic Oath, is instinct in anyone who's ever watched a sonogram, and so forth. So yes is my answer to that. Excellent. Let, let me we just, have some questions. Yeah, here's a question from a Simon Johnson from, <laughs> from Houghton, Michigan, of the Evangel, ba Ev Evangel Baptist Church. This is directed to Christopher Hitchens. How does the law of the conservation of matter, that no matter can be created or destroyed, factor into the theory that out of nothing all matter is suddenly created, by, created the so-called Big Bang Theory? Well, there must be, men, the, the, in fact, I happen to know there are many people in the audience better qualified to answer that question than I am. If you read, um, say, Lawrence Krauss's account of the Big Bang or, or Stephen Weinberg's The First Three Minutes, you have to, what you have to picture is something like a baseball, uh, out of which in a fraction of 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 a millisecond, uh, 400 billion galaxies are about to burst. The fact of the matter is we are not able to picture that. We can picture something like the second law of thermodynamics and conservation of matter. We can't. Our minds won't do this job. Remember, the term Big Bang was invented, like the term suffragette or the term impressionist or Tory, uh, as a term of abuse uh, by Fred Hoyle. He said there are some people who think, ha, huh, it all began with the Big Bang. The overwhelming evidence now is that it did, and that everything was inside that baseball until... So I was once asked by an intelligent child to whom I was trying to draw this picture, my daughter, actually, my younger daughter. <coughs> okay, what was outside the baseball? You can't do that. You can't do that. Einstein couldn't do that. Fred Hoyle can't, couldn't do that. Weinberg can't do it. Krauss can't do it. No one can do that. Maybe Jay Richard. But I yield the floor. <laughs> but I think anyone who's willing, like to, but anyone who's willing to make a leap of faith might possibly do it. Give so I yield the I yield yeah, balance of my time to. Yeah, uh, and of uh, course we, we both agree, obviously, on the, the veracity of Big Bang cosmology. I mean, a, an implication of Big Bang cosmology, you can just sort of think of it uh, as running back the tapewards on cosmic time, so that there, there's a point sometime in the finite past, as it has been put, in which all of space and matter are compressed into a point of infinite density and zero volume. That's the picture to which Arno Penzias responded. Penzias was the co-discoverer of the cosmic background radiation, that this is what he would have been led to expect by the five books of Moses. Now, Penzias is a Jew. He believes in God. But he saw this as in some way a, a confirmation of what he believed the fundamental truth of his religion told him, which is that the universe is not self-existent, but had a beginning in the finite past and was caused or called into existence by God. Now, this is a remarkable discovery. I cannot think of a more decisive contradiction of the materialist worldview than direct empirical evidence that the material universe, matter, space, time, and energy itself, came into existence in the finite past. And it confirms what St. Augustine himself said which is that God created time along with the physical universe. This is not a mathematical proof of God's existence. Well, but if you're weighing the evidence, this looks to be pointing in the theistic direction. This is the best opportunity you'll ever have to answer the question I posed at the beginning, which you didn't answer uh, subsequently. <clears throat> in that case, why can we be sure that nothingness is about to be delivered to us instead of somethingness? By the extraordinary events that I just described, the heat death of the universe, the, the doubling of the speed at which it's expanding away right. from itself, um, and the collision of our galaxy with the galaxy Andromeda, which is booked for five billion years from now. When, so our somethingness is certain to be replaced, not in infinite, but finite, measurable, predictable time with nothingness, and you have nothing to say about that plan, that planner, that design or that designer. You can't go on ducking this question any longer in my submission. You have, everyone is waiting with bated breath for you. <laughs> I don't think that there's anything in the theistic view of the world that entails the universe as eternal. I think Mr. Hitchens is a oh, oh, life. Uh, assuming some particular perspective that I do not represent. The life everlasting? Uh, the life everlasting in just uh, Christian metaphor. theology, no, it's not just a metaphor. It describes a transformation of the physical universe as we see into something of which we see a foreshadowing in Christ's resurrected body. I don't think that that doctrine is inferable from physics or cosmology, though, nor do I claim that. So I that's why I'm not that. speaking of it. Okay, let's go on to the next question. This is from 
past. And by the way, five billion years. I must say, I give you credit, Christopher, for worrying about what's going to I'm really not worried about billion, that. Also, five billion years from now, <laughs> it's pretty soon. I, I, I you are, you're, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting when I'm on. Well, it's a lot nearer than the Big Bang. Well, it's, a, it's interesting when I'm on the. We're when, when, I'm on, when, I'm on the when I'm on those shows on CNBC, I can't get them to talk about anything more than tomorrow. Anyway, this is from Pastor Paul Price of Indiana, Pennsylvania, where I recently was, actually, Mr. Hitchens. Does it not take more faith to take your position that all things just evolve from nothing than to believe in intelligent design by God? It doesn't involve any faith at all, is the answer to that. By the way, on, your, on this point about uh, five billion years not being very long, there was a lecturer who was giving this point about Andromeda, and someone got up and said, did you say five billion or five million? And the yeah. lecturer said, I said five billion. He said, that's a relief, five million. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so relax now. Um, it is, in fact, it is, as everyone here has studied physics, even in as little as I have, uh, in, in cosmological time, very, very soon. I mean, we can already see Andromeda with the naked eye. It's beginning to fill our night sky. It's a, we're a lot nearer to this than we are to the Big Bang, about which people speak so confidently as God's uh, presumable work. So, get real about that, I would. Um, the, there is no, if you assume evolution by natural selection, no act of faith is required. Uh, because everything works on that assumption. Uh, you can, if you're faced with a new virus, sequence its DNA, uh, show its kinship with your good self, um, work out how to defeat it, work out perhaps how to preempt uh, the, the next. Everything, predictions can be made. This is not just a theory, as some people are fond of saying. It's a, it's a bit better than that. Anyway, there's no, nothing wrong with being a theory. It's a theory which survives tests. Uh, whether applied to discoveries in the remote paleontological past or the present biological moment or the very fairly predictable uh, uh, biological and um, immunological future. We can, we can rely on it. It's not a matter of faith at all. It's what happened. It's in the, the molecular biological record and it's in the fossil record. There is no question but that evolution by natural selection did occur. There is some question about how, and these gaps are being filled in. Whenever, one is, uh, whenever uh, new evidence is discovered, it is found to be congruent with, compatible with, the existing knowledge in the field. Uh, no one is entitled any longer, and in fact the effort's almost been given up, to assume that the gaps produce a mystery which can only be filled by an explanation from the supernatural. That's now considered to be too lame for most public consumption unless you go to the Ohio Museum with the animatronic children and dancers. Who, by the way, who, who considers... Which I recommend, by the way, that who, you do. Who does consider it that lame, Christopher? What? You said it's considered that it's lame. It's considered pretty lame but to... Who, who considers it's it considered pretty lame. lame, I find. I can't... I, uh, our comrade of this evening, for example, hasn't taken the opportunity to plead that case. I find it's increasingly rare among creationists to find that those who uh, subscribe to it will argue the god of the gaps as confidently as they once used to. But, but when it you hasn't said, happened tonight. But you said it's considered. I mean, it, well, who, I'm saying, that who, I'll rephrase it if you like. Uh, it, it appears to be uttered with considerably less confidence and frequency than it did. I notice uh, the that, Reverend Cromarty is even nodding there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jay? Yes, I'm, again, I, I hope someone is taking count of the subjects that are being discussed and the number of insults that are being hurled from one or the other podium tonight. Uh, but I, I fully agree. I don't think the, the arguments... I, I don't think the argument before us tonight about theism or atheism ought to be based on the things that we don't know. I think it ought to be based on the things we do know. And I think we do know with a fair degree of certainty that the universe is not eternal, but it came into existence in the finite past so that it forces upon us a fundamental question that deals with one of the first principles of logic. The universe had a beginning. We know something doesn't come from nothing. Everything that has a beginning has a cause for its existence. The universe had a beginning, so it must have had a cause for its existence. It can't have caused itself to come into existence. This is a strongly theistic piece of evidence drawn from the best science of the day. And we seem to be talking about Mormonism, we seem to be talking about uh, the various crimes of various religions, but we seem not to be talking about the public evidence on which I think the case for theism needs to be made in the 21st century. And so I hope you're taking account of that. I hope you remember the basis on which the evidence is being made. Oh, wait, wait a second. 
Wait, wait, wait. We're, it's, it's not... We're, right, I, I, I can... You have to write you, down the questions if you want them answered. Right. I, w I can say, I, we, we discussed the infinite regress question uh, earlier. The claim is not, again, that everything has a cause for its existence. If the universe were eternal, if we had some reason to think the universe is eternal, then the universe itself wouldn't require the question. But we have empirical reason to think the universe began to exist. Every view of the universe, of reality, is going to have a fundamental resting point of explanation. So the question is, what's the fundamental reality that has always existed? We know the universe is now a crummy candidate for that explanation because it began to exist. God did not begin to exist, nor do we have any reason to think so. So in the competition between the two hypotheses, we know the universe began to exist. That's why I think in that particular piece of evidence, theism wins the day over materialism. Here's it's a not question. Even, not, not even casuistry, you just said something can't come into existence uncaused unless it's God. No. It, well, God did not come into, into existence. Ways. God did not come into existence. The argument is that everything that begins to exist must have a cause for its existence. That's the argument. With it's the not everything has a, cause. With the exception of your a priori No, the universe itself. No, not at all. The universe itself might not have had a beginning. It might have existed from eternity. Here's we know that's not true about the universe, so it calls for a cause. Here's a question from Tracy in Ontario, Canada. I, I think this town is called Staines or Stainer in Ontario, Canada. Uh, at one point there was organic or inorganic matter, and then there was organic matter. How did organic matter originate? We'll start with, so you usually start with Christopher, we'll start with you this okay. time, Jay. Yeah, there is this, this fundamental question, everyone recognizes it, it's, it's not as if the, the atheists or the theists recognize this as a problem. There's some fundamentally or qualitatively different reality that we see in the origination of life. Life differs in some fundamental way from the things that we see in mere physics or mere chemistry. Uh, there's, there's a, of course, a debate, there's a huge debate simply about the definition of life. The, the fundamental reality that I would say is different in life that you don't have in mere physics physics or chemistry is information. And information, I would argue, is a fundamentally different type of reality from mere matter or chemistry. If you think of it this way, think of text that's written on a page, right? Physics and chemistry can explain the properties of the ink, the properties of the paper, can describe why the ink is a good medium uh, for holding some kind of information. But the information on a page, the message, is different. It's grounded in the medium, right? But you can't explain the information itself in terms of physics and chemistry. In the same way, you can't explain coding regions in DNA in terms of bonding affinities or physical laws or basic physical or chemical laws. There's a fundamentally different type of reality. So that when we're asking the question of the origin of life, we're asking the question of the origin of biological information. This is very important because information theorists such as Henry Quassler point out that we habitually and quite rightly associate the origin of information with the activity of intelligent agency. So that when we find an origination of information someplace where it was not before, I think it calls for or suggests intelligent agency. Again, not of the existence of God. This is evidence for design that conduces toward theism, but I think it certainly points in that direction rather than atheism. Christopher? But, but the more we know, the more it replaces the question. I mean, there are there were forms of quasi-life, so pre-bacterial, pre-microbial, pre went off for an extraordinarily long period of time. They don't appear to have been exactly conscious, but nor, nor precisely inert either. Microscopically uh, evolved into later forms, it goes on in this pointless, rather horrible, rather boring way for a very, very, very long time. The point is, what designer wants to make it come out like that? Meanwhile, as life gradually takes hold, 98% of its forms are obliterated, without pity. If it wasn't for us knowing about them, they would never have existed. They only exist because we know about them. They didn't otherwise ever exist at all. And if we go, which we might, they won't have existed any more than we did. Now, who wants to make it come about like that? Take the project of eternal life, which I'm glad to find is nothing to do with any other concept of eternity that we could possibly give an end to. This, uh, it's, a, it's God's target, apparently, that we all attain this. And because I'm now talking to someone who has openly said that they are a believing Christian. Well, now, I've often wanted to know, if that's what he wants us to have, why do we have to go through this horrible interlude where the odds are stacked against us? What's the point 
of what used to be about 20 years of, of miserable life where it's almost impossible to avoid committing a mortal sin to now, thanks to our, many to our efforts, okay, you've got 80 years where the odds are stacked against you. You're, you're born sick, you're created ill in a hostile environment and commanded to be well. And if you can pass certain tests with the odds stacked against you, then you'll get eternal life. What is this? What designer does this kind of thing? Wants it, thinks it's fun to behave this way, thinks there's any justice or point in any of that. What is this, really? But here's another insult for you. But the rantings of frightened children trying to make sense of things they don't understand and terrified, terrified of a dictator who they're willing to appease and propitiate by sacrifice to the murder of their own children. This is not good for us, morally. It's not good for us ethically. It makes no sense intellectually. It makes no sense scientifically either. In fact, I don't think you answered the question. But where the, where what the, was the question again? Question, <laughs> no, no, Christopher, you, you, and is it your belief that the scientists believe that, that organic matter has existed as long as inorganic no, matter? The, the devout lady who asked this question, who well, emailed this in, so, until recently didn't know that any of these phenomena had ever existed. If you told her a hundred years ago, that everything was specially created uh, by God. She'd have believed that too, or that the fossils were put in the rocks by God to test our faith. She'd have believed that just as well. Now that she knows better, she says, ah, all that proves is that God was more ingenious than we thought. Just as those who used to deny the Big, ba big Bang or the evidence of physics, now persuaded of it, or unable to refute it, say, oh well, all it shows is the designer was cleverer than we thought. This is an argument that fails for a very famous reason. The reason put forward by Professor Karl Popper. It is unfalsifiable. And unfalsifiability, as every trained mind knows, is the test not of the strength of an argument, but of its weakness. This argument cannot be defeated. It cannot be overthrown. It reverse engineers every discovery we make and says, oh, that simply proves God is smarter than we ever thought. So these are the same so people. So who, who are the these same people, people who so would have said that the fossils yeah. were put in the rocks to test our faith. So then, Christopher, so your answer is... So um, I don't really accept the grammar of their questioning. So you... So you <laughs> Well, wait, just a, a well, point you, of clarification. How can you possibly we have, have a debate minutes. where you just say, I don't accept the question? I don't accept the grammar of the question. I don't, uh, someone who doesn't actually believe in science at all, who's been reluctantly persuaded. Well, how do you know this of woman the, that you might know? <laughs> she, because she, she emails that question wherever I go. <laughs> She's followed me all over the place. So. So, wait a second. so you think I you're know, being I know only too well. The, the Pope now says, oh, well, yeah, yeah. maybe the, the Big Bang shows that God was smarter than we thought. It's, um, it's all knickers, isn't it, to argue like that? So so there, it means, it means that nothing, okay, nothing well, one can possibly say can, be, can count as an argument because all of it only proves the ingenuity of the designer in the first place. And this comes from people who used to believe that uh, special creation occurred. Um, that the human eye couldn't possibly have been done except at one go. The only thing that can't have happened was the only thing they could be induced to believe. When they're told, actually, there are 40 different species of eye separately evolved, and that the only way it can have come is by evolution, they say, oh, come to think of it, that shows how smart God is. This doesn't meet the, the definition of a good question or a good argument so at all. It's, better, it's not even good propaganda. So you're just grading the question as a failure yeah, question? Yeah, and that one doesn't pass. Okay. How, how about... <laughs> How about, uh, how about this one? We have, have two minutes. Have scientists ever observed a distinct species evolve as distinct from changes within a species? Jay. Is that mine? Um, it, 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 this, uh, I could object to the grammar of the question and join you, I suppose, because the problem is that it's a question of, the, of uh, what the definition of a species is. The well, Galapagos finches, for instance, uh, it's often defined in terms of uh, uh, being able to reproduce uh, among your kind, but of course you're separately isolated, it's difficult to verify that question. And so uh, what exactly is a species and whether or not one species has evolved into another, I don't think it's a, a, a crucial or important question in the debate we have 
here this evening. I think it's quite possible that one species could evolve into another. I do think that most of the very good evidence for the power of natural selection falls under the survival of the fittest rather than the arrival of the fittest. So it's questions like variations in the thickness of finch beaks in the Galapagos Islands based upon variations in the climate so that seeds uh, change the properties. But you have a cyclical variation. You don't have the, the origination of some fundamentally uh, different kinds of organisms uh, or organelles. And so I think that natural selection in principle has the explanatory power to explain some of these minor things. I am unpersuaded that it has the, the power to explain all of the adaptive complexity in biology. And I think we're discovering, with increasing frequency, structures that are inaccessible to the Darwinian mechanism and that suggest foresight. Christopher? Well, when, um, About a minute. when the ridiculous figure of Governor Michael Huckabee said he didn't believe in the theory of evolution, he said he didn't believe that he himself was descended from a monkey. Now, that means he doesn't even know what the theory of evolution is. Um, <laughs> He, doesn't, he disbelieves in something he doesn't know. If we were descended from monkeys, we might look a bit more like Governor Huckabee, I sometimes think. <laughs> the, the, the theory is this, that we have common ancestors, that, that is, yes, we can very, very definitely, by studying the human genome, we can very definitely show the emergence and existence of a new species, our own. Uh, so no longer are there any Cro-Magnons uh, or Neanderthals to rival us. Yes, it's very plain, written all over us, what Darwin calls the lowly stamp of our origin, that we and they have a common primate and mammalian ancestor, but we, Homo sapiens, are now uh, a new species on the planet. That's indubitable, undeniable, sometimes, I think, rather unattractive, but it answers the question, the grammar of which was very well phrased. <laughs> then we have some closing comments. Right? Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so we can now say, I think, that we've heard two incredibly smart human beings, Cro-Magnons, uh, discuss this, and I must say, I... Primates. Primates, primates. I, for one, feel myself very much more, much better informed than I was an hour and a half ago. I'd like to thank you very much, Christopher. You're so, totally wrong about Nixon, but then so is everyone else. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Thank you very, very much. You both did a beautiful job. I'm really stunned at the early addition of both of these gentlemen. Very glad I never had to play against either of you on Winstein's money. Anyway, thank you very, very much, to ladies and gentlemen, for being here. Thank you so, so much. Now, now do you want to talk as well? Yes, yes. First of all, I want to thank everybody for participating in this, uh, Christopher, Jay, Michael, and of course Ben for hosting this. Um, before we go, Ben, I know you've got a project in the works. In fact, it's going to be coming out, I believe, in April. It's a brand new movie. Well, thanks to the generosity of, the, of a foundation that uh, uh, was funded with money from Christopher Hitchens, although he doesn't know it yet. Uh, we have made a uh, movie exploring the differences between intelligent design and Darwinism and uh, questioning various people who have been expelled from their universities for questioning Darwinism. And uh, it's a movie that doesn't really say that we dispute Darwinism, just questions why people in the academic setting where freedom is supposedly de rigueur are not allowed to question it. And, uh, we think it's kind of provocative. I'm sure it will provoke Chris, and, or Christopher, rather. And uh, uh, I think if the people, I don't think it's going to be able to be viewed here, but it can be viewed at home, correct? We do. In fact, we've got a trailer It's right only 90 seconds. It's only a very short movie. It's only 90 seconds. We hope, we hope you'll enjoy it. It's 90 seconds. So here's a sneak preview of the movie. I was viewed as an intellectual terrorist. If you have questioned Darwinism, that's it. Your career is over. I have been told to shut up. Just stand up and question Darwinism. You'll find out how risky that is. There are people out there who want to keep science in a little box where it can't possibly touch God. Religion. I mean, it's just fantasy, basically. Scientists are not allowed to even think thoughts that involve an intelligent creator. We cannot accept to treat intelligent design as an alternative scientific theory. I'm frightened by this, but...
but I'm not going to let it stop me from investigating and from speaking about it. information about the movie by going to expelledthemovie.com. The movie comes out in April. And Ben, as we close, is there anything lastly that you'd like to say here? Um, again, we're coming from Stanford University Live. Anything about the debate or about your movie? Well, I think it's been a very civilized debate. I was uh, concerned that it would be more bitter than it was. I think uh, both parties conducted uh, it's, uh, themselves brilliantly. and. Uh, I feel as if we learned a lot, and uh, that's very appropriate to Stanford University, and I hope that people have more questions on this subject. We'll watch Expelled, and uh, there'll be many, many, many more of these debates we're going to be staging uh, all around the country, and I hope people will feel free to participate. Well, again, Christopher, Jay, Michael, and of course, Ben, thank you so much for participating in this debate. Thank you, uh, Stanford University, for letting us be here, thank and thank you, you for Motive Entertainment for...